Galatians 3. Hang on. I'm going to put a stop to that right now. Galatians 3. Good to have you this morning. So far, I've gotten um, about 50 emails from YouTube claiming that the song I use on the Watchman broadcast is copyright infringement. And the company or the person claiming that it's their... See, I use the same song, Watchman broadcast, ever since January 2009, I did the very first one. And the music that I got was bundled in some video editing software that I was using at the time. And it's royalty-free music bundled in a package that I purchased. Didn't steal it. Didn't illegally download it. Bought it royalty-free for use. So, and it's still online. You can go and buy this exact same song to this day from the same company that I got it from. But a different company is claiming that it's their song. And so they're going to send me 500 emails. Because I've guessed that that's about how many Watchmen broadcasts I've done since 2009. They're going to send me four to 500 emails. And I'm going to have one of my girls this week answer i'm going to i'm going to bomb youtube back with all those emails they're sending me and whoever this is claiming that it's their song because i sent the link to the the place where you can buy that song i sent the link to that to youtube to say you the wrong person is claiming copyright infringement it's not even the same person who's claiming it so if YouTube's going to send me 400 emails, we're going to send 400 back to them. Now, it's not going to hurt me. It's not a strike. They're not going to take my account down. It's just that YouTube is like if somebody picks a song they like on the radio or whatever, and they put it in their video that they make and put it on YouTube. YouTube used to just let that go, but now because all these people want their copyright money. So whoever song they pick, YouTube says, okay, we'll let you use that song, but we are gonna make everybody who watches your video watch an advertisement so that we can pay the royalty for, use, for you using that song. So whoever watches the video with the song on it, YouTube sticks an ad on it and makes you watch the advertisement before you watch the video so that the money can go to the per and that's that's fair okay because if i if i was a songwriter and i made my living writing songs and i had a hit song and that was making my income for me and somebody using it i should get a royalty for that if it's played on the radio i should get a royalty from it if it's downloaded from walmart or itunes whatever i should get a royalty from it. so i don't i don't mind it it's just that I don't think the person claiming this, the copyright owns that song. Because that another, I can buy it from another company straight out. Anyway, I don't get it. Anyway, Galatians 3. I'm just getting that off my chest. So one of my, one, somebody that works for me this week is going to be awfully busy writing emails back to YouTube. Galatians 3, verse 15. Paul's explaining the difference between the covenants. And I... Talked about the covenants a little bit. Talked about a contract a little bit last Sunday morning. Uh, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth it or addeth thereto. And, and what he's saying is what I said last week. Even if it was a, a, a man's covenant, between an agreement between two people, two parties, that, co that covenant cannot be disannulled even here on earth. It's legal and it's binding, especially if you write it down. And especially if you write it down, you cannot alter what's written down. It's written. That's why we have written contracts instead of you buying 
a $25,000 automobile shaking somebody's hand, hoping that they're not giving you a lemon. That's why we write contracts down. That's why our Bible is a contract and it's written down for us. And I'll say this. I don't know if I said this last week, but I'm going to say it again. An oral agreement does not and cannot alter a written contract. Once it's been signed, an oral ag arrangement after the written contract is automatically annulled and void. It cannot supersede a written contract. So, and this is my big thing, because you have all of these people claiming that they're now getting revelations from God and words from God past the last words of the book of Revelation. Kenneth Copeland's done it. Kenneth Hagin's done it. Joyce Myers has done it. All of these people who claim that God's given them a word of knowledge. God's given me a word of wisdom. God's given me a... He's told me that God told... Joseph Smith, for crying out loud, Joseph Smith claims that he got another testament of Jesus Christ that supersedes what's in this Bible. And it's hilarious to me that Joseph Smith's claim is that an angel from heaven showed him where to find another testament, another gospel, and he dug it up, and it's these gold plates written in reformed hieroglyphics, which nobody's ever seen before. He translated them by himself, and the Mormons claim that the Book of Mormon is perfect in every way, shape, and form, but the King James Bible translated by over 54 men. And we know for a fact that during the seven-year process, I'm hyped up this morning over this thing, that during that seven-year process, if the translators ran into an area where they needed help, they reached out to all of the what they called the divines, which were men of God, pastors, bishops, biblical text scholars. They reached out beyond the group of 54 to ask for their help in translating a certain passage so that more than 54 men was involved in it. And it was all, and, and it was peer reviewed. Once one group translated their section of the Bible, they took that and gave it to the next group. And the next group reviewed their translation while this group reviewed this group's translation. And it went in a circle like did that. And it was purified seven years. Purified seven times, the Bible says. And according to the Mormons, the King James isn't translated right, but the Book of Mormon's perfect. With one guy translating from gold plates with, with cuneiform and hieroglyphics on there that nobody else has ever seen. They say the Book of Mormon supersedes the Bible. And that's exactly what you're seeing in Galatians 3. Even if it's a man's covenant, it cannot be annulled or added thereunto. Book of Mormon shot all of the claims of Ellen White. Who says that an angel from here, here we have another angel visiting her, taking her to heaven, showing her that the Ten Commandments are written up in heaven with God's finger and they're all got glory coming out of them light shining out of them but the fourth commandment is shining brighter than all of the rest of them and the angel telling her that Christ died and nailed nine commandments to the cross but not the fourth commandment so we're still have to adhere to resting on the Sabbath day or, or according to them going to church on Sabbath day so we have another issue of an angel from heaven bringing another gospel Adding it to the end of the book of Revelation saying, you still got to keep the law in order to be saved. And that is exactly what Paul's dealing with in Galatians. Makes me, makes me mad. Because I'm like David in the Psalms. I hate every false way. I hate false gospels because I know that they're designed to put men in bondage. And I hate bondage. I've been in it. And once you get freed from it, you're going, 
I'm never going back. I'm not going back there ever again. Somebody say amen. Okay? So those, all of you all, whoever's listening, who have come out of cults, you've come out of Hebrew roots, you've come out of Jehovah's Witness, you've come out of Catholics, you've come out of Mormons, you come out of, uh, Pastor Cooley and I were talking last night about some of these independent fundamentalists who add all these rules onto you about your hair length and whether you can wear pants or not. They add all these things to salvation, saying if you don't do, if you don't do what they tell you to do, you're not really saved. And I, I hate that. I hate it. I used to be that way, and God took me out of it. There's liberty. I'm, I'm going to preach this morning. There's liberty in Christ. Yes, there is. But I guarantee you, if you're a real child of God and you step out of line with God, God's got a rod ten foot long, a foot for each commandment, and He's going to beat you with it until you conform to His image. But He'll love you while He does it. Amen. So anyway, you, you, don't add, you don't add anything to the gospel. Anything. So, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, and that, this I say, and I'll explain all this, this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Yeah, Michael, we're still getting people telling us that the sound, the audio is warbling online. So listen to what's going on online and see, I don't know, I restarted the computer, I don't know what's causing the problem, but anyway, we'll have to work on it this week. So anyway, the law came 430 years after God's promise to Abraham. So the law cannot disannul the covenant that God made with Abraham. So he's saying, verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here's, here, watch this now. God took Abraham in, in fact, turn to Genesis 13. Let me show you this. Let me show you, let me show you how God, how God's signature is in your Bible. I love this. Genesis 13 is about the strife that went on between Lot and Abram. He's not even Abraham yet. He's not been given the new name. He's still Abram. And there's strife between Lot and Abram and their herdsmen. And they're, because God had blessed both of them so much, they were running out of pasture ground for their cattle and well waters for their, for their, for their livestock. And their herdsmen were, getting, were fighting. And Abram goes to Abram is meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. And Ab Abram goes to Lot. Now, Abram could have said to Lot, Lot, I don't know why your guys are messing with my guys. Everything you have is because of me. So you tell your guys to back down. But that is not what Abram said. And you follow that example. You let God handle it. God will give you the world. So Abram said, Lot... Wherever you pick, I'm going to let you have it. Whatever you say you want, I'm going to give it to you. And you think about this. Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom, and he lost everything. He lost everything he had. He had the clothes on his back and two daughters that he ended up sleeping with while he was drunk. That's how Lot's life turned out. So look at here, look at you, and I'm going to show you something. Look at verse 13 of Genesis 13. You want to know what the number 13 means? But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. If you'll take a minute and count the number of words in that verse. I'll give you just a... There's 13 words exactly in verse 13 of chapter 13. What does the number 13 mean? The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Okay, 13 deals partly with wickedness and sodomy. Sod the Sodom is Babylon the Great in type and foreshadowing. Now look at verse 14. So the, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated unto him, look, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art. Look at here, look northward, southward, westward, eastward. How many fingers am I holding up? 
Four. Four Gospels, four places. By the way, those are ever never-ending lines. He's not just promising him this little circle of what he can see. He's giving him everything. Everything. In all four directions to infinity. He's giving him all of that. That's the covenant that God made with Abram. That's the inheritance. If you look at verse 18 of Galatians 3, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here is God give, swearing to Abraham, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you endless infinity. You're going to inherit it all. And that was a promise made to Abram and his seed, which is Christ. And if we are in Christ, then we get that inheritance. So what he's saying is, God made a promise to Abram 430 years before the law ever showed up. The law cannot disannul the promise that God made to Abram, which came before the law. You understand that? God cannot break the covenant that he made to Abraham and to his seed, which is Christ, and us who are of the faith of Abraham, who believe in God, the law cannot annul or make void the promise that God made to Abraham. Um, turn to Hebrews 8. Turn to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 is quoting Jeremiah 31. So while you're turning to Hebrews 8, I'm going to read Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold the day of the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he said, after that, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers at Mount Sion, or Mount Sinai. In other words, I'm going to give you a new contract. And it's not going to be the same contract because you broke, that, you broke the Mount Sinai contract. You broke it multiple times. You voided that out. So God says to us and to Israel, I'm going to, I'm going to be good to you. I'm going to, be, I'm going to be better to you than anybody has ever treated you in all of history. Everybody's hated the Jews. So God says, I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to make a better covenant with you. It's going to blow your mind. Here's the covenant. I'm going to forgive every transgression you have ever committed. I'm going to forgive it. Just wipe it off. Trust me. And I'll forgive every one of your sins. So now look at Hebrews 8. Verse 8. The number eight is the number for new beginnings, new life. Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. There's somebody that I know, and if I mention the name, you would know it. I have not reached out to this person yet, so I'm not going to say their name publicly. But they have, they have gone from this church into Hebrew roots. Meaning that they are now claiming that you are saved if you keep the law. If you're keeping the law, then that's the evidence that you're really saved. And they've, gone, and they've gone into Saturday worship and keeping Jewish feasts. And, and I knew it was coming. I saw it coming. I knew the influence that this person was under. I warned them about it. I have not reached out to this person to try to plead with them because I love this person very much. But that's what they've gone off into. And it hurts me. It bothers me. Because I know for a fact that it's a deception. The, Satan is telling you Yes, you must keep the law. When the truth of it is, he's then, as soon as you fail, Satan's going to climb all over and you said and say, you, you didn't keep the law, you're not saved. I know that. I know how it works. So verse 10, 
of Hebrews 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Let me ask you a question. Are you here this morning? Brian, are you here this morning? Because I called you and said, if you don't show up for church today, you're going to hell and you're split hell wide open. Or are you here because you wanted to be here? Okay, I did not call you and say, you're going to hell. If you don't show up for church this morning, you're done. You're going to hell, you're going to split hell wide open. You're here because you know you need to be here and you want to be here. Raise your hand. These people came all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. Because they got tired of looking at the back of his head. They won't see the front of it. So now maybe they're going, okay, the back's better, but we, we, they, no, I would just. They can't, they're here not because I'm, you people online, there are families online right now that are watching every single service we do, not because they have to, because they want to. It's in their heart. That's the difference. If I honor God by doing what's right, I'm not doing it to make myself saved or to keep myself saved. I'm doing it because I will love God and I don't want to fail Him. That's the difference. Doing it as a child, you, you make your bed and clean your room because you have to. Somebody told your mom told you, I'm going to whip the life out of you if you don't clean that room up. And I'm going to preach on that. Next few Sundays, I'm going to preach on how God's raising Mike Hoggard. You do it when you're a child, you do it because you have to. When you grow up, you make the bed because you want to. Sister Betty, who makes your bed every day? She does. How, how many years have you been making your own bed? Never, don't mind, you don't have to say that. About 75 years. Okay. She just gets up. She knows that nobody, the, the, the bed fairy is not going to come in and make the bed for her. And her hired help ain't going to make it. <laughs> she don't have any hired help. So she gets up and she wants a nice bed to get in tonight. So she's made her bed already. She did it because she wanted to. She came to church here because she wanted to be here. And when we do right and we do what God said, it's because it's in our heart. And we're doing it because we want to do it. Not because we know that it'll keep us safe. God will already, he's already hold on to us. That's the difference. And people don't understand that. So, um, verse 13, in that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Think of your body. Here's the difference between the outer man and the inner man. The Bible says that my inner man never gets old. It is renewed every day. But my outer man is perishing. Parts of us don't work anymore. Or they don't work the way they used to. You can't hear as well. You can't see as well. You can't talk as well. You can't walk as well. And, that's, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And then you're going to get so old, you're going to die. That's the old covenant applied to the old body, the old man. But the new man in you is as young as it was when it was first conceived. It's renewed every day. Remember Naaman, the Syrian who came to Elisha, the prophet, and said, I've got leprosy all over me. I want to be clean. And when he was told to go dip in the River Jordan seven times, when he finally did it, what did his skin look like? A baby skin. Like, like he was newborn babies newborn there's nothing wrong with them they're got nice pink soft skin they're so soft our inner man is renewed every day it never gets old and it will never die amen and rather than moses being the mediator between us and god moses is dead 
And yet Christ now is the mediator, Hebrews 12, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Oh, I love this. Because in Genesis 4, do you know what it is that Abel's blood? Remember, okay, let's go back to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, Cain slaughtered Abel. Cain is of the wicked one. He's a picture of Satan. Abel is a picture of Christ, who, who was innocent, and yet he was slain. And when God came to Cain, he told him, The blood of thy brother speaketh from the ground. The blood is telling me that, Cain, you shed his innocent blood, and I'm going to hold you guilty for it. So that's Abel's blood speaking. But here's Christ's blood speaking better things than Abel. Because Christ's blood was innocent, completely innocent, and it speaks to us that it covers all of the sins that we have written on the books of the things that we've done wrong. The blood has covered those. And it's not, think of the, when you think of the blood, you think automatically of something red, but you have something else in your blood. It's a different color. It's white. White blood cells do one thing, and they do it very well. What do they do? They heal. They cover, they cover uncleanness. If you've got a germ in your body, Here's what the white blood said. I've done a teaching on this. I, God, I said, God, I don't know anything about blood. Show me about blood. And in one day, God's just going, <laughs> my mind exploded. White blood cells, when they find uncleanness, the first thing they do is cover it completely. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose transgressions are covered. So the white blood cell covers it completely, completely doesn't leave any of it uncovered. The second thing it does is it breaks it into tiny thousands, millions of pieces. God said he would take his enemies and dash them into pieces. The third thing it does, is once it's broken the uncleanness, it eats it, consumes it. God said that Christ, when he comes back, is going to consume the Antichrist and all of his armies with the spirit of his mouth. He's going to consume them all like white blood cells consume the uncleanness in your body. So that when the white blood cells have done their job, it is, listen to this now, it is as if it was never there to begin with. Isn't that cool? It's as if it was never there. The judge told me that. When I got a speeding ticket in Hillsboro, Missouri, and it was so much, I had to go, I couldn't pay it, I had to go to court. I'm so embarrassed. So the judge, I get up in front of the judge, the judge asked me, okay, you're charged with doing, what was 65 and a 35? I honestly thought it was 55. I honestly did. But it's 35. And I told him, I said, my neighbor, you probably heard about this. My neighbor's daughter, 13 years old, for her birthday, got a four-wheeler. First time she rode it, she rode down the street, died. I did her funeral that day and was coming back and wasn't paying attention to the speed. So he said, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll give you a one-year suspension and sentence. And what that means is, as long as you don't speed and get another ticket in one year, this will be as if it never happened. And God made me go to court to find that out. And so I said, but he said, you got to pay the court costs. There's always an earthly price to pay. Amen? Amen? So I paid the court cost. I was prepared to pay the fine. But I paid the court cost, and I guarantee you for a year, I did not speed through Hillsboro. And after that year, you can look, my record is clean. It is now as if I had never done that. There is no, it was completely taken off. That's what white blood cells do to defilement in your body. 
That's what Christ's blood has done to the sins that are written on the books. They are completely covered, and it's as if they were never there to begin with. Now, you show me how what you do does that. And in fact, now let me ask you this question. How many times have you had to tell your white blood cells to cure your body? It's automatic. Automatic. Mm. <laughs> and you know where the white blood cells come from? You know where they come from? Your bones. And a guy did, he showed me this. He said, Mike, if you, if you don't add the bones that are in your legs and your arms, in your body and head, you have 66 bones. That's cool. That's the blood. You do not tell the white blood cells in your body to cure your body. They do it automatically. So 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much? All. all of it. Just like the white blood cells, completely covers it, and it's as if they were never there. The world might remember it. The devil might remember it. God says, it's done between me and you, and I'm the one that counts. Well, that's sweet. Amen. Now, let me show you why there's so many sins. Turn to Galatians 3, verse 19. Did the bell ring? Huh? Okay. Because sometimes I ignore it and I keep on talking. Galatians 3, 19. So wherefore then serveth the law? Why did God give the law? We know in Genesis 2 that God only gave Adam one law. So there was only one sin. He was naked, right? Right? It was not even against the law to be running around naked, which it is now against the law. Uh, KMOV had on their app, police arrested a guy who was in his car smoking marijuana completely naked somewhere, in a park somewhere. Completely naked smoking marijuana. It's against the law. They got charged with public indecency. Adam's running around naked. He's, it's not even a sin, right? Not even a crime. There's only one sin because there's only one law. Well, they committed that one sin. What does that tell you? That we're so, we have it in our nature that we're so defiled and corrupt that if God reduced everything down to just one sin, we would do it. Because Adam did and Eve did. So Galatians 3.19 says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. What, here, now watch this. God's going to make sin exceedingly sinful. He's going to take it from one sin to all kinds of sin. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So ro turn to Romans 2 very quickly. There's, I probably will back up on this next Sunday because it there's a lot here to say about why th there's so much sin now why did God add the law why did God do that Romans 2 gives us a glimpse Romans 2 verse 1 therefore thou art inexcusable O man whosoever thou art that judgest so what if there was only one law and half the people broke the law, the other half didn't break that law. The half that never broke that one law could say to the people that did break that law, you broke God's law, but we didn't. Ha, ha, ha. We're better than you. I'll give you an example. There was a law that said if a man and a woman was caught in adultery, they had to be taken out and stoned. That was in the law. That was in the Bible. So, these hypocrites, they catch a man and a woman in adultery, but for some reason, the man gets off free. So they drag the woman out before Jesus. And they say, 
They're going to tempt him. Rabbi, master, this woman's caught in adultery. According to the law, she must needs be stoned. And here's what Jesus said. Let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now, out of all of those people in that group, in that area, there actually was one who had never committed any sins. He had the right to condemn her. And he was the only one that had the right. But he didn't do it. What did he do? Woman, thy sins be forgiven thee. That was us. We are that woman. So Romans 2, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. So let's say that Ross broke God's law somehow, some way. Can I judge and condemn him for breaking God's law? Can I do that? Do I have a right to do it? No. I don't even have a right as a brother if I go to him and I know he's broken God's law. I saw him do it or I knew he do it, did it. If I go to him, I'm not supposed to go to him in judgment. I'm supposed to go to him in um, re recovery or what am I trying to say? Restoration. Because Galatians says, lest thou be also like unto him. Because I've sinned, people have had to come to me and restored. And so I've had to go to people, not in judgment, not in condemnation, not beating them up, and say, let's, let's ask God to forgive you and let's have some restoration here. That's what I'm supposed to do. Now, if they don't do that, you take it up a notch. You bring somebody else with you. Try to, it's still trying to restore them. The third thing you do is you've got to bring them before the church, still trying to restore them. But if being brought before... And most people will never let it get this far. Most people just run off and leave. But even the church is supposed to restore them and forgive them. And if they don't confess it and repent then, then they have to be cast out. Okay? And that's God's way of doing it. But I can't judge anybody in this church for anything they've done wrong because I myself have also. So, verse 2. And that's why God made so many sins. There are some sins that is at least five times in the law that you're not supposed to lay with a beast. I don't need to be told that five times. Okay? That's something I've never, never entered my mind. But believe it or not, some people have. So, I haven't done that sin. But I've done others, and I'm not going to tell you what. So, I can't condemn anybody because... They did their sin, and I did mine. And that's what he said. That's why there's so many different laws now. So many, so many different sins to be committed. So, verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commits. It's the judgment of God, not the judgment of us. God who is righteous has the right to judge, and he will. And verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? And here's, now, here's what people do. I've been around long enough to know this. The wicked human nature of church people is if they can find out something dirty on you, they will blast you with it every time. And that is their attempt at covering up their own sins. If they can find fault in you, then they'll concentrate on that and they'll go after you to make themselves look righteous. But they're not. 
So you always watch that person who is in a church or on Facebook or anything else who is always condemning everybody for everything they do and say. That person there is covering up and trying to look righteous by doing that. Which is why you don't see me on Facebook very much. Because I get sick and tired of these people. Something you do and say, they're going to blast you on Facebook because you violated scripture. Because you're standing in front of something that said Disney World. And Disney World's part of the Illuminati. And how dare you go to Disney World. And they'll blast you for something like that while they're sitting looking at porn on the computer. Or something else. You know what I'm saying? You know that type of people? I got no use for them. That's why they're doing it. They're using that as a cover to look righteous while they condemn everybody else. God will judge. God will get them. Amen? I got to finish this. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And the, 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 fact, the, the fact that you came to church today is because God long suffered with you. My mom did not whip me for every wrong thing I did. But she did whip me. She long suffered with me. So has God, or I wouldn't be here today. Amen? That's why God made so many things wrong. So that everybody is under sin. Everybody is. And God will not allow any one of us to judge any other. Father, your ways are right and holy and true. Forgive us, first of all, for our own transgressions. Forgive us also for our own judgment of others. Judging their transgression before we repented of ours. Jesus, you alone are the righteous, holy one who will judge all not us. Father, let this word go into our heart. Plant it deep inside. Help us to realize, God, that we are not saved by any good deed we've ever done. We're saved by your mercy and your love. We love you. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.